Welcome to the Cedar Falls Committee of the Whole meeting this April 15, 2019. I'll now call this meeting to order. We have two items on the agenda this evening. One is the small cell siting, and number two is bills and payroll. I'll invite our Community Development Director, Stephanie Sheets, for the first item. Welcome. All right. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm here today to give you a little bit of information about small cell siting and talk a little bit about what we have been doing. Um, as this has been something that uh, actually the state passed some legislation. I can't hear anything. In uh, 2017. Hold on one second. I got to speak into the speaker. Can you hold the microphone closer, Stephanie, so Mr. Cruz can hear? Sure. Can you hear me a little bit better now? A little bit. Otherwise, Denny's going to have to work on that uh, in the meantime. Sorry, go, go ahead and we'll hopefully okay. be able to hear on that end. Um, so as I was mentioning, um, the state passed something in 2017 and actually there was a um, FCC order that came out about six months ago and I'll talk through a little bit of all of that. But uh, some of you may be wondering, well, what is small cell siting? This might be kind of a new term or maybe you've heard a little bit about it. Uh, and I'm going to show just a very brief video that I found when I was kind of looking into it and thinking about how would I best explain this. Um, but what I wanted to show with the graph here first is just there's been a lot of, uh, there's been exponential growth in the area of um, cellular communications and if we think about it we all like to have our uh, smartphone with us we use a lot of data in looking things up and enjoy that uh, and so this is part of the reason for why this is coming forward but I think I'll turn it over to show this uh, just a little bit over a two two minute 30 second video that probably gives you a really good overview of what I'm talking about While the requirements for 5G won't be set until at least 2020, three principles are emphasized in every evolution of cellular standards, capacity, throughput, and coverage. Small cells will be critical to meeting those three requirements. Small cells is an all-encompassing term for low-powered radio access nodes that help provide service to both indoor and outdoor areas. These nodes can work in either licensed or unlicensed spectrum and have a range between 10 meters and 2 kilometers. The purpose of installing small cells is to increase range and capacity in densely populated urban areas that cannot be sustained by macro cells alone. Small cells have defined purposes when it comes to providing end users an improved cellular experience in congested urban areas, increasing capacity in areas with high user densities, improving coverage in available data rates, and extending handset battery life by reduced power consumption. Small cells have been further divided into microcells and picocells, depending on the input power and antenna height rad center. Microcells with typically up to 20 watts and above 35 foot rad centers. Picocells with typically less than 5 watts and below 35 foot rad centers. For a small cell network to be a financially sound investment for carriers and enterprises, it must adhere to a few requirements. Low cost. Coverage is being provided to fewer subscribers, so costs must be kept down. Easy to manage. The huge number of small cells being deployed means consolidated management is necessary. Outdoor furniture appearance and lightweight design. Small cells are often mounted to street lights and signs, so there can be restrictive requirements laid out by landowners. High weather reliability and safe to touch design. Small cells provide street level coverage while being close to human activity. The Internet of Things, 5G, smart cities, to realize the potential of the future will require optimized small cell antenna infrastructure. These antennas must continue to integrate more bands with a higher order of MIMO. The continuing challenge for operators is finding the right innovative yet cost effective small cell solution for a selected site. This must happen while optimizing signal coverage and without interfering with existing cell sites. Small cells will come in a myriad of different shapes and sizes. So that's just a quick overview of what we're talking about. Um, these are some images that I pulled, just some different ways that uh, small cell wireless can be done, whether it's an extension on an existing street light, whether that be a decorative light or not. You can see the, the nodes at the top there, whether it's a, a new pole itself or uh, even the example of uh, down in a manhole. Um, 
So as I mentioned, the regulatory uh, framework has really changed for small cell or changed for wireless overall, I should say, and I'm no guru on this at all, but just trying to give you a little bit of the highlights here. Um, I should also note that we've got um, employees with Cedar Falls Utilities here in the audience, so if there are more technical questions, uh, we may be able to help answer those as a team. But historically, we've seen cell towers on private land. You've seen, you see those around the community. Our our most recent one actually is the Candio Church there with the cross off of Green Hill Road. The cross is a cell tower that we approved probably about three or four years ago now. Uh, but explosive growth in data is what's prompting uh, the discussion that we're having tonight and some of the regulations that have been passed in support of expanding uh, 5G networks. So uh, this FCC order that occurred in September of 2018, we became aware of that late, in, late last year and uh, knew that we had, we thought we had till around July to adopt something, but more recently uh, we've learned that April, actually today, is one of the time frames of local communities getting something adopted so that we can have some control and then we kind of see how things pan out. We're just not sure how things are going to go. There's actually a challenge to the FCC ruling that's occurring. Don't know how long that will take to get ironed out or what will come out of that, but we at least want to get uh, something uh, in line to anticipate something like this coming to our community and I'll talk about why in just a little bit. So again, that order uh, is strengthening the carrier's ability to implement and uh, kind of limiting a little bit the local government's uh, ability to um, regulate this. However, we can adopt some reason, what's called reasonable rec uh, regulations. That can be a difficult uh, term to determine. Um, but we, what I'm proposing tonight, we're fairly confident in, and I'll explain why in a little bit. We can take some steps to try to maintain the public interest of why we uh, have an interest in maintaining that right of way. We can also adopt an uh, application process, what the cost might be, although the state of Iowa does set that for us, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Um, but there is then also a shot clock that's in effect that we have to act on applications that we receive. And that's not necessarily something that concerns us. Um, that type of shot clock has been used on other things and we're able to meet that without a problem. So 90 days is not a, an issue for us as long as we get a process in place. So the steps that we'd like to talk about uh, taking, the first two are what I'd like to talk about tonight in terms of adopting some design guidelines and setting an application fee. Um, then from there, we would use what uh, council agrees with to establish an application form so that as these start to come in, we can make sure that the, the guidelines are being met if those are adopted. Uh, we are also um, looking at some type of wireless facility siting agreement. Um, the council's familiar with approving utility agreements. I think we just had one on the last council agenda where we kind of have a standard agreement and then if CenturyLink or Orion or Mediacom wants to locate in the right of way, they uh, enter into an agreement with us. We review the permit, we also have an annual fee. So that's the same thing that we're looking at, something that's a little bit more um, personalized, I guess I'll say, to the wireless situation by drafting an agreement that I'm referencing here on the screen. And then we'll just simply monitor what the developments are and how we may or may not have to change going forward. Just uh, this being so new, we're just not sure what to expect. And for that reason, um, when we get to the uh, wireless agreement and drafting that, We'd like to, um, we're exploring right now the services of an attorney that's very well versed in these regulations and kind of what's happening in the field. And um, we're concerned about what we might not know. And so by using an attorney that is well versed that way, we feel we can bring something uh, pretty good to the table. So the purpose of design guidelines. Uh, the image on the left is uh, an example of what could possibly happen if we don't have something in place. I don't want to put a lot of fear in or overreaction, but without any type of guideline, anything can happen. So uh, the picture on the right would be more what our guidelines would be than looking to establish as something cleaner, something that really complements the right of way uh, and also continues the purpose of maintaining a majority of the right of way and a majority of the poll for the purposes that they are already there for. And this is simply an add-on that is not very intrusive. 
Also another example is in uh, taking a look at other communities. We've had, I've seen things like this where they said, well, the image on the left is what was proposed and the image on the right was what it was installed. So again, then this goes back to uh, the application including a rendering and making sure that's very clear what is proposed so that we might be able to go back and say, no, wait a minute, uh, you didn't tell us all of this was being added on and now we need to review it again and see if it meets our guidelines, for example. Um, I should say before I go on to that one with this, what I was going to mention before getting into what do our guidelines uh, look like and giving you an overview is what I'm proposing in terms of the guidelines are actually very similar to guidelines that the city of Waterloo adopted and they actually borrowed them from, I believe they said the city of Dubuque. So there are other Iowa communities that are adopting design guidelines and ours would be very similar with some of our local tweaks to that. So getting into the proposal that will be on the council agenda tonight for council consideration, uh, one is to establish what would be preferred locations for small cell siting. And uh, like I said, the other communities that we kind of um, used in developing this are, we would be matching them very similarly here in terms of industrial, which are highlighted in green. I just wanted council to have an idea of kind of where you might see these popping up if we were to adopt the design guidelines. We would call uh, first preference to be industrial, second preference about uh, highway uh, areas, so uh, along Highway 20, and then third preference <coughs> being uh, retail and commercial districts, and all of those are highlighted in red. Um, using any of our zoning districts that are commercial or like the um, some of our other um, commercial type of districts that aren't C1, C2, or C3. We have a couple others, uh, planned commercial districts, that type of thing. And then uh, the fourth one yeah. being that, of course, we would like to encourage co-location as much as possible so we don't have a bunch of uh, new poles out there, single use, and this is the same thing with uh, cell towers that, that co-location is encouraged. Uh, however, then there will be a little bit of an aesthetic review of if you get too many, it starts to look bad as well. So uh, we want to have that discretion in there to um, uh, make that decision. So in order of preference, just to give you an example of what uh, these look like, we identified mm. then not only the areas of preference, but then where within that area might uh, we prefer these to be located. And the first would be what we're terming in the design guidelines as a non-decorative municipal service pole. And that's a mouthful, but basically it's that standard cobra head light, maybe adding an antenna onto the top of that. Second, if they're looking at an uh, example like this of a wood pole that has a light on it with very few or maybe no utilities in order to uh, locate there, replace it with the previous <coughs> picture's example, um, make it a nice uh, street light and, and go ahead and add on. Uh, the third would be if there are no poles in the area and they meet the spacing uh, requirements in the design guidelines, we might see something like this image uh, appear and we would encourage something like that. Fourth would be um, to consider pretty much further down the line here, we have these decorative poles in place because we want a certain image and, and feeling to our area, so that's why it's lower on the list. We wouldn't want to be locating there first. Uh, however, if there is no other option, we would prefer this over putting up a new pole that might not um, look as good or might not match. Although we do have some matching criteria that we're integrating as well. So uh, we're hoping to make sure we've covered all the bases that way. I don't have a picture for sign poles that are 15 feet or taller. I don't know how many of those we have, but um, this is something that's a carryover from the other communities that have adopted this. Um, I do have a picture of what uh, street furniture might be, which you saw in the video as well. Maybe it's a, a bus shelter or some kind of kiosk or something like that. You can see the antenna kind of up at the uh, right at the top of the roof there. And then last preference is, um, sorry to go back, last preference would be a uh, utility pole. So in terms of placement, um, we're looking at a variety of areas that we think are important to cover. Um, we put a little bit of um, our community um, 
fingerprint on this, but we wanted to be sure that cables and hardware are concealed. That's a very common thing that communities want to be sure that it looks good. Uh, antenna size is limited. That's We didn't change that from the design guidelines uh, model that we were borrowing. Uh, equipment to be minimal. Again, that stays the same. And this picture just shows an example of what happens if that equipment gets a little out of hand and is it minimal. And that may not be, I wouldn't want to say that that is all a small cell thing, but it's an example of just a lot of equipment in the right of way and how we would want to try to um, keep that limited. We'd also want to make sure that it's positioned so that we don't have sight issues, because again, that's part of the reason for having the right of way is to make sure that it's safe for uh, all modes of transportation uh, and making sure that vehicles can see adequately. Uh, mounting flush to the pole, again, some of these things are pretty basic, but if you don't say them, you don't mm. get them. Um, and then the last one, I have an image that I want to demonstrate the spacing and what I mean there. Um, First, uh, it, it calls for one per block, and we're defining a block as, a, as approximately 300 feet. But then what happens if they want to put one on one side of the road and one on the other side of the road and might want to do every 300 feet on, e on both sides? Well, that's why the one per uh, 250. So this image just shows, for example, and it just takes University Avenue as an example, um, generally one per block in the 300 foot spacing. And I believe this image actually shows them co-located on a street light. And then uh, if we went to the one per 250 spacing, um, it shows then how they would be on alternate sides of the road, for example. But what you would not see is you would not see the, the top image every 300 feet and, and red dots on the north side of the street. So that's what this provision accomplishes. We have a variety of aesthetic provisions in the design guidelines that are in front of you uh, about concealment. The, uh, one of these pictures shows how maybe you would conceal something that's mounted on the pole itself there with banners. Um, we don't necessarily call for that in our design guidelines, but we do talk about concealment if there's a lot of equipment. We want the pole material finish design to match what's already within the immediate area. I think we defined it as uh, nearby. Um, we want the equipment screened or camouflaged as much as possible or, and reduced in size. And this other picture shows, I saw a lot of pictures where you saw something that looked like a mailbox. So I'm believing that that may be equipment for the pole since it's positioned in all those pictures so close to a, an antenna. Um, undergrounding the service lines, again, if you don't say it, you don't get it. Um, limiting the signage and making sure that that's really just related to calling in an emergency. It's not about advertising for the product that's there. And then finally, no lighting uh, unless that's, you know, they're creating a street light and that's part of the camouflage design. And then lastly, and again, I'm giving you a really high level and I'm not getting into a lot of the details, but hopefully hitting on the things that might be most important to council or for, the, for you to know, uh, then there's a ending provision, just kind of a general catch-all about meeting all of our standards and ordinances, um, making sure they get permits, whether it's a right-of-way permit will be applicable, as well as maybe an electrical permit, uh, maybe a foundation permit if they're putting in concrete, that type of thing. Uh, tree maintenance, uh, again, just making sure that that we've made it clear we don't want you to do something like this image shows uh, where uh, tree topping can get out of hand and really start to make the area look even worse and it won't blend in and obviously if uh, there's graffiti we want them to take care of that it doesn't become a city responsibility so again, then tonight, um, what the steps that we're looking at are the first two steps in terms of adopting some design guidelines, um, and then the second would be adopting an application fee. And I mentioned at the beginning how this is actually set by the state of Iowa. Um, what the state said is that it's $500 for the first one, and then if um, there are more that are submitted with that, uh, up to five, then like number two, three, four, and five are $100 each and after that it's $50 each. And then the state also set the reoccurring fee, the annual fee, at $247 a year. Uh, so that would be what I'm proposing that we adopt uh, to comply with the, the state as well as to, to manage this and pay for some of the time that's gonna be involved with this. 
Um, going forward then, uh, like I said, we'll develop the application form. Uh, we'll be working at a staff level on a standard agreement and trying to get the best agreement together so that as these come through, uh, we're confident in what we're uh, recommending to council. And then we'll continue to monitor the changes that are happening in this area. So with that, if there are any questions. Thank you, Stephanie. Mr. Blanford. Uh, Director Sheets, um, in the models that you looked at, were there um, options for like a non-compliance non penalty or uh, something of that nature? My concern is if we get to a stage where we're having to put a lot of city staff time into um, you know, checking to see are you complying with the regulations or we have a graffiti issue and you're not removing it in a timely <coughs> fashion um, and we're having to send staff out to do it, I want to make sure we're recouping city resources for that rather than just relying on you guys to... Yeah, uh, it's a really good point. Um, when you establish guidelines, you um, sometimes our ability to, to, well, we do not have the ability to issue a citation, for example, under guidelines. That would be a reason why to adopt an ordinance, and we're actually talking with this attorney about taking that step down the line. So I think it would be kind of difficult to address some of the things you're bringing up, but they're very good points. I'd like to see something when we bring it back to council to address those. Thank you. Mr. Burrow. Um, you mentioned that there'd be a requirement that the cables not be visible. And so I'm assuming that these run on some kind of electrical Can't power. Hear. Sorry. Um, how do they do that so that the, they are paying for the electrical and not our taxpayers? I'm looking at Bill Scoobel that maybe he can help me a little bit okay. with how these are typically handled since he's probably going to know a little bit more if I can put him on the spot. Um, they would have a meter just like any other customer of ours and be on a standard rate. So is that part of what's shown in the picture or is that yeah. another item that goes on the pole? Yeah, it, it's up there in those boxes. We would, our plan is to use our AMI meters. So it's not like we have to have a meter reader, get up there and read it. It can be read remotely, but it can be up in those boxes and it's kind of fits in up there. Okay. You went further, Mr. Wieland. Yeah, a couple of questions for you. One. We've got a lot of tall existing towers, some of them are on University <laughs> Avenue, and they're shared towers with different providers sharing the same tower. Does the small cell to small towers compete with that business? And will the towers that are lower have multiple users on the same tower? Does each supplier have their own? My understanding is that the small cell complements those towers, and that's how they're, if you recall from the video, how they showed multiple nodes, they're trying to make that tower, I guess, work more for them is, is the way I understand it. How does it complement? I think that they um, communicate back to that tower, so they help with that tower's range, uh, as well as uh, its ability to broadcast at a higher level, I believe. Okay. Again, I'm not an expert. Mm -hmm. And can you put multiple users on the same small uh, cells? We are planning through the guidelines to encourage co-location. So maybe um, if you saw some of the pictures that I showed, I, my rule of thumb right now is I think that if you were to get over two on one pole, it will start to look like there's a lot there. Um, but I guess we're simply going to have to see how it goes. So each provider would have his plates up there, so you have multiple sets. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Green? Uh, yes, uh, Director Sheets, when you were looking around at other cities uh, and you saw things like um, bus stops and signage, things like that, were the providers putting out the, the furniture itself? Or, w w is it integrated into it at the factory or are they just sort of sticking things into existing furniture? Um, it ranges, actually. I think, for the most part, they're trying to utilize what's there and match it so that it doesn't stick <clears throat> out. Um, as we talked with CFU, um, Bill was relaying to me that um, there are, uh, like the, the Cobra head poles, those standard light street lights, that the wires are all integrated in inside the pole, to get back to your question a little bit. Um, so th there's more and more innovations happening, too, I think, around this. Does that answer your question? Anything further, Mr. Blanford? The other uh, concern or question I have, Director Sheets, um, like for the, the image you showed of the tree that's been scalped off the top, basically, is there any um, discussion or concern about making sure that we have property owner notification? I know they're primarily in the right-of-way, but we want to make sure somebody doesn't come home from work and find the 
top of their tree sheared off to make room for one of these, and that's the first time they knew we were putting small cell siding anywhere. Right now, we don't have the design guidelines to do any property owner notification. Might be something to consider. Anything further from council? Uh, Mr. Just Mr. Back to the co-location thing. What's, what's the potential of, uh, how, how many pot potential of these devices could we have on one pole? I'm wondering if we want to have in our ordinance limit of two per, I mean, is there a potential of how many carriers are there and what's the? Well, we talked as, as a group a little bit about this um, and thought we didn't want to specify a number because, I mean, if it's done well, maybe it'll work out and we just simply would need to see an image. So that is one of the things that's in the design guidelines that the um, proposing uh, company would have to show, uh, give us a graphic of what they're proposing. And so let's say there's already a small cell there, then they have to show how they're adding on and what that looks like. Um, so we thought that that might be a better way to do it right now than set a hard number and end up getting more poles than we need if it actually turns out to look okay. It, it's a judgment call. Well, and we just spent so much time taking wires down and you know, clearing the landscape and we're gonna put more poles up with things hanging off of them. So yeah. it, I wouldn't mind seeing a limit to, but I, just a thought. And Stephanie, can we limit that based off of our own ordinances, well, like, or is it I mean, based off what the state comes back to us for? There might be two things going on with your question. I wasn't sure when with your last comment, you said about wires being undergrounded. Um, we certainly the that spacing criteria will help with that. It doesn't eliminate the possibility, um, but in terms of uh, we can take a look into whether the state says anything about a, a limit on co-location. I'm not really familiar, and I don't know if. Um, Bill, would you have any guideline on that at all? Apologize, this is kind of a new concept, so. Sure. Yes, um, I don't know that the, I think the big thing is if it's done right and it's kind of designed in, you could make two look good. Um, and I think what our, our intent here was is, you know, if you can make two or three look decent, we'd be okay with that right. and and i i'm not sure that the legalities of being able to say no you can only have one i think that was a little bit of a that's a little bit up in the air on the legalities of you know then it begins to be a land grab basically if one company comes in and gets all the spots they basically cut everybody else out and, and that was a little bit i think where the legalities would come in that we wouldn't be able to just say okay, one company, you've got this whole street because you have all the applications. And so that was why we were a little, you know, it still leaves the door open for somebody else, but they may be tasked with, it's gonna cost a little more to make it look decent. I agree with that. Plus I would add the, the federal uh, order uh, definitely wishes to discourage local communities from substantially impairing these carriers' ability to, to place these small cells. So a hard, hard number. <clears throat> Uh, probably would not fly. It's just ironic that we've spent so much time and take pride in how, like, University Avenue looks without all the wires and everything, and now a new technology is going to come along and make it look like Disneyland. I, I'm not saying it will, but I don't want to open that. I'd hate to see that can of worms open. But. Mr. Blanford. Yeah, Attorney Rogers, if I'm not mistaken, there's a substantial amount of litigation at the state and federal level on this currently isn't there agreed um, from a legal standpoint sort of the unfortunate part for cities is there there is uh, no stay issued so the federal order is in place uh, while this thing's being litigated anything further from council mr wheeler uh, just a quick question on lower towers is there any concern in certain areas that vandalism might be a problem we have um, some specifics on how high they need to be up. It's a minimum of eight feet. So um, that, that could be susceptible to some Snow vandalism. Balls, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Boer. So the de design guidelines like you've outlined pretty well cover any concerns of the utilities in our public works. Is that correct? 
yes, we've talked with Public Works about it, let them know it was coming, and um, also gave them the opportunity to take a look at it as well as engineering, and then met with CFU a couple times. Um, so we've kind of proceeded as we, we don't have a choice. If we want to have a little bit of control, we should adopt something. Um, we know that they're not perfect. We're probably going to have to change them going forward, and we might have an opportunity to get a little bit narrower um, under that review with an attorney. Thank you. Anything further from council? There is a motion for a request from staff on the small cell siting. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. The motion second. Since we are taking action at the committee, I'll open it up for any public discussion or public comments that relates to this item. Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Aye. Motion carries. Moving on to the next item, is there a motion to approve bills and payroll? So moved. Second. Motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. That motion carries. This concludes the Committee of the Whole uh, meeting for this evening. We'll wait to the top of the hour for the regular City Council meeting. Thank you. <laughs>